If you've ever wondered just how much fitness you lose after taking some time off running, then this video is for you because we're gonna be talking all about detraining and I think you might be surprised by some of the answers. Detraining. So I first started looking into this concept of detraining a few weeks ago after my recent marathon. So I ran a marathon seven or eight weeks ago and was really surprised at how much apparent fitness I'd lost in that recovery block. So once I recommenced training, I felt like I'd lost a lot of fitness and it was quite depressing actually. And not just that, but on race day, I felt that I had lost fitness since my last long run. So my taper didn't go to plan. Um, to cut a long story short, I was dealing with some runner's knee through most of the training block. And so I made the decision to taper much harder than I had planned. So the first week of the taper, I cut my volume by 50%. And in the second week of the taper, I actually didn't run at all. So no running at all. I did some sessions on the elliptical and tried to mimic some of the sessions that I had planned to run. But I didn't run at all. And was surprised on race day when I felt not in as good a shape as I was on that last long run. Um, because in my mind, I thought that people made too much of a thing of missing training. I don't know why, but I've always believed that it took a lot longer than that to lose fitness. I thought that taking a week off um, wouldn't hurt fitness at all, that I could only gain from that in allowing my knee to rest. Now, looking back, it probably still was the right decision to take a week off because my knee did need to rest, but I definitely lost fitness. So the first study that I... Well, this first one isn't really a study. It was an article published by a guy called Mike Young on EliteTrack.com. So he's, he's listed some timeframes of what happens in detraining. So detraining is basically a t any time that we stop training. Um, it doesn't include time when we're cross-training necessarily. This is when we just stop. So he says within one to two days, beta endorphin and adrenaline levels drop and our mood is effective negatively. I can definitely vouch for this. I hate taking days off. I currently take one day off a week in my training on a Sunday, and I definitely notice a mood drop. Those endorphin levels just aren't there. I really struggle during tapering, so I can definitely vouch for that first one. Um, so he says that between days three and five of no training, the muscles start to lose elasticity and aerobic capabilities drop off 5% by the fifth day. That is huge, 5%. And this isn't a long time. We're talking between three and five days, not even a week. Our aerobic capabilities can drop off by 5%. So yes, I wasn't going insane. On race day, I had lost fitness because I took seven whole days off, not just five. So according to this, I would have lost around 5% of my aerobic capacity. Day seven to nine, um, VO2 max drops by 10%. So we're talking just a week. Day seven to nine, VO2 max dropping 10%. That is huge. By day 10, our body's metabolic rate begins to drop. Eat less or you'll gain weight. <laughs> I can certainly attest to this one. If you've seen some of my other videos, you'll know that after the, my marathon where I just kind of had no rules and went a bit crazy, I, I think it, I gained five kilos in six days. Yeah, so I can attest to that one as well. Eat less or you'll gain weight. So days, thir sorry, days 11 to 13, maximum heart rate and cardiac output declined by 15%. Muscle tone sees first appreciable loss. Days 14 to 16, mitochondrial activity in muscle cells begins to decrease rapidly. Loss of muscle mass, strength, and metabolic rate occurs. You get the idea. And so days 20 to 21, VO2 max has dropped by about 20%. 20% in three weeks. That is wild. Days 22 to 25, 10 to 15% loss of muscle mass. And... To make it worse, that lost mass is replaced by fat, 10 to 15%. Days 27 to 29, muscle strength drops by as much as 30%. I found this mind-blowing. As I said, for some reason, I was under the impression that it took a lot longer to lose fitness and 
much less muscle mass as well. But according to this, it happens really quickly. 5% aerobic drop off by the third to fifth day. Amazing. I wish I knew this before. The second study I found appeared in Frontiers in Sports and Active Living in January 23, and it was called Estimating the Cost of Training Disruptions on Marathon Performance. So for this study, they basically were data mining Strava. So they looked at 300,000 marathoners between 2014 and 2017, and they found 44,000 of those runners who had both completed a marathon with no interruptions and also completed a marathon with at least seven consecutive days where they weren't training. So they could compare how they did between the two. Now, obviously, with any big data study like this, there are lots of issues which we won't go in here. I mean, it's really obvious. Even ones like, you know, they say they found people who had missed seven consecutive days. Well, all they've got is Strava information. Maybe those people didn't actually miss those days. Maybe their watch battery just went flat. So you get the idea. But all that being said, their findings do back up um, the current research and it, it just makes sense. So they found that uh, people who miss between 7 and 13 days of training during their 12-week build ran 4.25% slower than when they had an uninterrupted build-up. Now, that is big. So remember, these are averages. So of those 44,000 runners, um, people who miss 7 to 13 days average 4.25% slower across the marathon, which is a lot because, I mean, missing a week of training, that doesn't seem like much but apparently it makes you 4% slower. If the gap was two weeks, they slowed by a little more than 6%. At three weeks, it was about 7.5%. So that, that's really big. And of course, one other obvious thing they found was that if you miss that training close to the race, that has more of an impact than if you miss the training early on in the block, which kind of makes sense. And one thing I found really funny, actually, they found that there was a greater cost for men who miss training than women. So men averaged running 5% slower, women 3.5%. <laughs> and one of, the, one of the kind of hypotheses they came up with is of why this happens is because men tend to overestimate their abilities. And I really laugh when I read that. I can definitely identify with that, that we men just think we can do it anyway and so go out too hard and end up paying the price later on. So it costs men more than it does women. And the, so the findings are pretty intuitive, but, and I guess, again, I found, found them so mind-blowing because I hadn't realized how quickly detraining sets in. And so because, you know, that other study was all about um, physiological changes that are happening, but I guess what I like about this Strava one is that it's, it's real world. So yes, okay, all this stuff in theory might be going in, in your body, but does it actually translate to race day? Absolutely. You miss between 7 and 13 days, about 4 to 5% slower. And it just gets more and more after that. So really fascinating. There are other studies I looked at which I won't go into. We, we get the idea. But also one encouraging thing I found was that a lot of, the, a lot of this can be offset through cross-training. And in particular, deep water running. So there was a study, I won't go into it into detail because this video is already probably too long. They took 11 well-trained runners and they substituted all of their running with deep water running. So they didn't run at all. All they did was deep water running for four weeks, so a pretty long time. So what we've just learned about detraining, if they weren't running or doing any cross training, after that four weeks, they would have lost about 30% muscle mass, lost upwards of 20% of VO2 max. They would be in a bad shape. Okay, so they didn't run at all for four weeks, but they were um, cross-training in the form of deep water running, and they held on to all of their fitness, both in like physiological lab tests, but also in real-world um, time trials. I think they did 3K, 5K, I, I forget how they tested it, but they tested real-world performance as well. Every single one of them maintained exactly where they were at beforehand, which I found fascinating. Um, so that's really good. So if you do get injured, like deep water running seems to be the best form of cross training for runners. And I find that pretty staggering that they can. So that, and these aren't just beginners. These are a well-trained 
you know, athletes who have got it going on, they didn't run at all for four weeks and managed to maintain fitness through deep water running. So I just wanted to share that with you because I found this quite mind blowing and I wish I knew it before. So what I've learned from this isn't don't ever take time off. I think it's really important to have that recovery block after a marathon. But in that case, like now I know what's going to happen. I can expect it and embrace it and not be surprised and really disappointed at myself. Like I know in a marathon recovery block, yes, I'm going to lose fitness, but it's okay. My body needs to recover. We'll build up again. It's all right. But outside of that marathon recovery block, I'm going to make it my goal to never miss more than one day's training. Because as we've seen, even two or three days does have an impact. And we want to be building everything on top of each other year after year, year after year. And, you know, I've, I've got lofty goals in the marathon. I would just want to see how fast I can get. In my mind, I would love, I don't know if I'm genetically capable of it, but I'd love to run a, a two-hour 30 marathon one day. Who knows? But in order to do that, consistency is absolutely key which I think is what the, all these studies point to. Like you've got to just keep at it. Don't take time off unless you need it. Because of course, if you're injured and you push through it, um, like it, even so not an injury, obviously you're going to stop for an injury. But if you've got a niggle and you decide to push through and it becomes an injury, if you then have to take several weeks off, you're going to be much worse off than if you just took a few days off. You get the idea. So it, it's difficult because all of this involves judgment and I think that judgment probably improves with experience, which a lot of us don't have. But I'm really happy I know this now. Basically, don't take time off unless you absolutely have to. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next one.